Good afternoon, Asheville. This is Yes You Can Radio Show with Ann Lee Waite. I am your host. Oh, it's a mysterious kind of mm, mm, overcast today, but it's a little cool, so it's wonderful. Just cooling us off from that heat. You are listening to the new WPVM Low Power Community Radio Station, 103.7 FM in Asheville, North Carolina. Online, you can find us at WPVMFM. Dot org, and we are live on our Facebook group, WPVM 103.7 Community Radio, featuring the arts and culture of Asheville. That's our group on Facebook. And if you check us out on Facebook, um, Davine and I did not make agreements about what we were going to wear. <laughs> We just we just happen to be in synergy with each other today. Yes. So uh, my desire is for the words that you hear, that the words that are spoken today, that they bless you and they bring you value. They bring you some understanding. My mission in life is <laughs> my mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive and to do so with some passion some compassion, some humor, and some style. That is from Dr. Maya Angelou. Um, before, when I was laughing, in the midst of saying Maya's quote, uh, the reason why I was laughing is because uh, Davin is telling me that I have not the right mic, <laughs> not the right lever up, so that when you start talking, when I don't hear anything, I know exactly why, right? I'm having, exactly. I'm having this, this t- tutorial because I'm kind of a little bit nervous. I've been doing the show now for over three months, but I've never had you, Davine, as my guest, so I'm a little tiny bit nervous. Well, I have my roar here, and I, I will <laughs> smack your wrist. <laughs> Do you know that when we were living in Bermuda when I was a child, I thought about doing piano lessons, but when I went to go and see the piano teacher, and she would take a, a wooden ruler, and she'd smack your knuckles when you hit the wrong key. So I never went back. <laughs> I don't think that kind of learning does me good at all. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not good at that kind of learning yeah. either. <laughs> Manuals and smacking me on the on the knuckles. That's not my. Those are the two. Oh, don't get me. <laughs> visual, visual, like a video. Uh-huh. You know, YouTube uh-huh. is like a wonderful learning curve. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, of I'm, course, of course, you already have to bring in technology into the conversation, see what right? You did. See, see. Okay. <laughs> So let me get through the beginning now. So the topic that most excites me is how do we shift from survival mode to thriving mode? How can we live better, living better in our bodies, living better in our minds, hearts, and spirit? How do we reach heart our course if the direction we are headed isn't empowering or life-affirming? Yeah? It's important to know how to be able to shift gears and how to go on a different track, how to be able to assess that, you know what, this isn't taking me where I want to be going, and being self-responsible for that, yeah? My guest today is the executive director of WPVM 103.7 FM, Devine Dial. From 1982 to 2012, when she retired, Devine worked as a professional designer. Devine began her professional career as a designer in New Orleans, developing and operating a business in the French Quarter adjacent to Jackson Square. She relocated to Asheville in 1989. Devine distributed her designs to exclusive retail shops and catalogs nationwide. Her work appeared in national magazines and graced the display windows of Saks Fifth Avenue's flagship store on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Upon retiring from the design world, Devine fulfilled a dream of attending Pendleton School of Craft to study fine metalwork. She hopes to resume her metal work once the station is well established in the community. She feels the opportunity to help develop WPVM from a dormant radio station is a thrilling challenge and she's honored to be a part of developing the station to its fullest potential for the community. So, so I, I, I got to start backwards and come forward into, into the present, right? So in 1982, you decided to become an entrepreneur. And so what is it about entrepreneurship that appealed to you 
that going and working for somebody else because some people think that job security is being hired by somebody else and allowing them to worry about getting them paid. I was, um, earlier in my life, I was always kind of envious of the few women that I saw who had their own business. Mm -hmm. And I... Uh, what era, what were we talking about, 19... So, 60s and early 70s, mm -hmm. 60s into 70s. Mm -hmm. And in my first marriage, I was uh, married to an army officer. And a lot of the foreign wives always, they always had some little import business mm -hmm. or something going on the side, mm -hmm. whereas the American wives didn't. But mm. the, Europe, but the, the foreign wives always... They were always hustling something mm -hmm. or getting something going for themselves. Right. And I kind of envied them, but I really wasn't in the position at the time or it didn't occur to me at the time that I could do the same thing. Mm. It took a while for it to sink in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, Do you think that that was an issue of confidence? I think it was an issue just not even thinking about it because... As being an option for I you was, because the picture wasn't, it wasn't very... I knew that they did it. I saw that they did it. Uh, I also saw other things uh, in in the, especially when I lived in Germany, that I did take advantage of. But that at that time I didn't need the money. Basically, mm. I wasn't hungry. Maybe right. that's what it was. Yeah, I wasn't hungry. Yeah. Uh, so um, in the early '80s, I was at a crossroads in my life and was ending a second marriage, and. Um, had come to the conclusion that maybe marriage wasn't a good <laughs> option for me because I was on number two. And I was I had been going to college. I'd started going to college in Germany. I had uh -huh. all, of, all of the requirements out of the way. I could not figure out what profession I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, any of the electives that I took were always literature related. Mm -hmm. Now that I look back on it, it's because at, at at that particular time, that's whenever I wasn't seeing, reading a lot of fantasy. It was, there wasn't as much bull floating around in the literature right. world as right. there was in the real world. Uh -huh. But, uh, and that's Didn't want to get lost in Harlequin romances and no, all that. No, I was reading good stuff. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, but I, I couldn't figure out what profession I wanted to be in that, in, and I didn't think that I was a literature teacher, professor, mm -hmm. professor mm -hmm. material. Right. And because it didn't that, even appeal to me. That was a real common profession for women to do. If they were going to work outside of the home, being a teacher was acceptable. Yeah. Secretary, and, receptionist. And, and I don't have that particular gene. <laughs> Some people do. Well, as a teacher, you mean? As, as a, um, to be nurturing a huge amount of people forever. <laughs> a profession. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> so, you know, my husband is a natural nurturer. He's got more nurturing in his little finger than I have in my old body. <laughs> so he's a natural nurturer. Uh -huh. But I didn't have that. So, mm -hmm. um, so I was going to Loyola in New Orleans, and the professor said, don't tell the administration that I'm telling you this, but you don't necessarily need to go into a profession you don't necessarily need to get e even get a degree right. to get out in the world and do what you were meant to do that was a powerful and there was a male professor there was a male professor yeah and i said well, yippee <laughs> <laughs> because you were thinking that the college degree was going to be necessary for you to just do something on your own professional wise well it gave me permission uh -huh. to say, that's it, I'm going out in the world and I'm going to make my living out of my own creativity. Right. Uh -huh. Instead, And I could sink my teeth into that. Having seen other, uh, what few women I saw doing something out in the world business-wise, mm -hmm. that I could do that. That was the most attractive thing to me. Mm -hmm. And so this happened in New Orleans, and New Orleans was a great place to cut your creative teeth. Mm. And, uh, let's see, that was in 82, so... In 83, word started getting out about the World Fair coming to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And they started opening up these kiosks. Do they still do that? The World Fairs? Yeah. 
you know, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Because I remember. But still, I don't have the answer to okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> but back hey, then. if any of our listeners know, hey, send us a, a message yeah. on Facebook, in yes. our Facebook group, if yes, you know. Facebook the, us. Yes. So, um, so I had started wholesaling my work, but uh, I, there was an opportunity to come in, came about to open up a little small uh, retail space in mm -hmm. the French Quarter. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did for the World's Fair. It was really great. It was, um, it was a wonderful learning experience. Uh, what, uh, what I started off with was I'm going to figure out how to do this. I'm going to uh, be consistent. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show up at the, my kiosk every day on mm -hmm. time. I'm mm -hmm. not going to be late, mm -hmm. and I'm going to uh, be consistent. I'm going to consider myself in learning mode mm -hmm. and um, consequently because I was consistent I got put in the best locations mm. because we had these little push carts that they pushed right, around right and so they would put me in the best location because I was consistent right and I was selling my work in other local artisans work and uh, I did very well uh -huh. but uh, I think your initial question was something about what did what the well, yeah. kind of concerns about doing that? Well, or? yeah, I mean, what motivated entrepreneurship rather than going and working for somebody else? What were, what are some of the, what did you consider to be some of the benefits to entrepreneurship? And did you even recognize that there were some disadvantages to it at the same time when you were choosing them? Uh, at the time, I wasn't thinking that it was entrepreneurship. Mm. I just thought that. Um, well, when my marriage was breaking up, mm -hmm. I had gone to the flea market in the French Quarter in New Orleans, and mm -hmm. I had all this household stuff that I was selling. And mm -hmm. I'm like, boy, if I just had more stuff, I could sell it. So maybe right. I can make some stuff and right. sell it. Right, right. So, so I, I got ah, the bug to right. make stuff because that you, then you have a bottomless pit. Right. Of you can make stuff and sell it. So that but, of course, of you still got to make stuff that people want to buy. You do have to make stuff, yes. It yeah. has to be sellable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so that's what I did. But uh, it happened that I was at a crossroads in my life. The marriage was breaking up. The marriages were not were had were not working out for me, mm -hmm. and I just that felt, was not the career path for you. <laughs> was, but I felt I felt like, well, I am just going to jump off of this cliff here with no net. Uh -huh. uh, because I've done it the way society expected me to in the past. Uh -huh. It hasn't worked out. Right. It can't be any worse than it already has been. <laughs> and I have absolutely nothing to lose at this point. Yeah. It, you had yeah, Exactly. You have nothing to lose. Plus, yeah. I was getting hungry then because I knew I was going to have to support myself. Right. And I, and I was like, okay, learn to stand on your own two feet instead of depending upon marriage because obviously marriage isn't working. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, and consider it an adventure, not mm -hmm. a scary thing. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's a little. Of course, it's scary. Mm -hmm. But uh, you have to evaluate what's fearful about it. Mm -hmm. Is it because you've never done it? Is it because there's danger out there? Right. Is it an appropriate fear or is it an inappropriate mm -hmm. fear? Mm -hmm. So I figured it was an inappropriate fear, mm -hmm. and um, so I just. And I didn't think of it at the time as being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I just thought, well, I that mean, sexy words only come into the the American lexicon and what in the last what twenty thirty years that they've kind of brought that in. It used to be a business owner. Now it's gotten sexy with entrepreneurship. Yeah. So I uh, did really well in New Orleans. Uh -huh. I. Get but back amazingly up. well. So you had some great principles in regard to when you started. You know, you said, "Okay, I'm going to show up on time, be consistent." Is that something that was innate to you, or was you had had you already learned? I'm glad you asked that because I had learned because in my college days I was taking a biology class, and the professor was very intimidating mm. to the class. And somehow, some way, students had gotten a hold of a copy of his final exam, and they were passing it around right. prior to our final uh -huh. exam. Uh -huh. And they offered it to me, and I'm like, no, don't think so. Right. 
And what I learned in that experience is the whole class was cheating and I had chosen not to cheat and I still got a B. Uh huh. <laughs> and right. but he was grading on the curves. So, right. so I'm like, whoa, how many people really are out there cheating in the world? <laughs> because of the whole class, right. practically the whole class was. And I'm like, uh -huh. I think it'd be an advantage if you don't cheat. Yeah. You'll learn more. Mm -hmm. So that's. You'll actually learn how to do it you actually, rather than pretend you, that you know you, how to and do your, it. And your confidence builds yeah. because of that. And um, so, so that. Uh, principles of consistency and um, being there uh -huh. and being being dependable. Also, I've tried to be as honest and as ethical as I could be. Mm -hmm. And that makes you stand out mm -hmm. because that's not always the case, obviously. Right. Being honorable in a, in a world that can convince you that you have to be a cheater in order to be able to get ahead. And that's what he... That's nice guys finish last, you know, that yeah, kind of thinking. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, that's that was the basis of when I got started. And, and I, can't, I can't tell you how much I have learned from it. All I can say is I would not be here now with the confidence and the ability to revive the station had I not built a foundation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. back in the early 80s right. of consistency being willing to learn, approaching it, it with a certain amount of joy right. and, and ethics. And willingness to take a risk. And being, willing to, being able to take a risk, understanding Believing in yourself risk. enough yeah. that you're like, you know what, even if I take this risk and it doesn't work out the way that I think, I'm going to be all right anyway. Right. Yeah. And I'm going to learn from it. Because right. that's what I, that's when, if you put yourself on a learning path, which I think is a, is a way to live life. I mean, I say sometimes I want to die with my boots on. Mm. I want to die still learning something new. Right. And uh, I know that from my own experience that if a challenge comes up, I'll be able to figure out what to do. Right. So if you are just catching us, you are listening to Yes, You Can radio show with myself and Lee Waite and my guest today is the executive director of the station, WPVM, Devin Dial. Uh, just a little announcement. Underwriter support for WPVM is made possible by the French Broad Food Co-op, a locally owned grocery store focusing more on people than profits by providing living wages, supporting local farmers and producers, and being community owned. More information is on the web at French Broad f for food. For co-op or food, food co-op? Food, food. That might be a typo. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, I'm just reading along, and then afterwards my brain goes, hmm, that doesn't sound like it works out. Um, uh, so when I was nodding my head before, because you said something that when you first started your business or you started working, it, you kind of treated it a bit more like a hobby, and then when you had to live from it, that you had to get serious and focused, and I, I completely related to that because I, I consider myself to be an entrepreneur of 15 years, but honestly, the first 10 years, I didn't need the money. <laughs> it was extra. So... Yeah, because I wasn't hungry, and until right. I got hungry, when... Right. When I got hungry, I got serious. <laughs> hunger is a good thing. Yeah. And, and if you don't have hunger... You don't put you don't put, yeah. you don't go at it a hundred percent. Yeah, and that that was part of the, this huge growth um, curve that I've experienced here in Asheville is because when I got here, then I had to really start looking that this had to be something that was self supporting, not just something that I really enjoyed. And um, this, the things that I used to say to myself before, because I'm I'm basically introverted, so I don't. I feel drained in the midst of a lot of people. So the idea of marketing and promoting myself and being in the midst of all of these people wasn't comfortable for me. But guess what? When I got hungry, I went to marketing events and networking events. <laughs> right? So it was getting hungry pushed me to a degree that all the things that I believed in myself that limited my abilities to, to be an entrepreneur and being a business owner, it just didn't matter anymore because at that point I just didn't have anything to lose because I was hungry. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that can, that's, that's a real uh, motivator. <laughs> I'm telling you. And then the other part about networking is that I, I, um, 
we have a, an expression in the Caribbean. We're talking about egging people, like bothering people, you know, calling and calling and calling and another message from, and that I wasn't supposed to, that, that that wasn't good, that I shouldn't egg people. But guess what? When I was hungry, I called people and I called people and they had to tell me a no. They had to make it very clear. They didn't want it or I was going to just keep calling, you know? So were you a bit li like that as well, too, that you were, you, you, what were some of the things that was kind of like an undercurrent thing that you had to grow out of? Because I, I, I there's, a, there's a question that I had further down the road where, what was it? Um, from your vantage point, do you feel that entrepreneurship is a gateway to self-discovery and not just a potential for self-determination? One of those things is that I'm, I'm, I, it's, it's so much less about the money as it is about all the stuff that I have to learn for standing into my ability to say, I'm good at what I do, you know? Well, number one, whenever I got back out in the world and started selling my uh, work wholesale mm -hmm. in, in the uh, New Orleans area, I uh, basically, any shop that I approached, I, I guess I would choose the shops wisely because mm -hmm. I always, they would always order. They mm -hmm. would always buy something. Right. So that was good. Uh -huh. uh, and so that was kind of like the beginning. And then um, I knew that if, if I could sell shops to shops in New Orleans, I could sell shops around the country. Mm -hmm. So... I already Do you think had. that your products that you created sold themselves, or was it about you? No, I'm I'm a soft sell person. Mm -hmm. I want the product to sell itself. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't want to ever, and I didn't then. I'd never wanted to be in the position where I had to do a hard sell and convince people. I mean, reads and well, there weren't, coaches. There weren't then. What right, there weren't then. But but I'm just saying that it there weren't. I just. I just um, I didn't want to be putting myself in in the position of having to convince people that they needed to buy what I was selling. Mm -hmm. I always liked the I appreciated the honesty of well I really like this and so here's the money. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple mm -hmm. concept, but it's very honest. They mm -hmm. either like it or they don't. Right. And so and if they like it, they they give you the money for it. When you started your business, did you have an, an assumption of success? Did you just assume that you were going to be able to make it? Or, or do you think that that's an important quality in which to have? When I first started, I had, I had a little stash of money because from the, from the first marriage, I had bought wisely and had a good collection of things that were sellable. Uh -huh. So I had a stash of money from auctioning off my precious items from the first marriage that right. I collected from traveling all over the United States and into Europe. Mm -hmm. So I started off with, well, I've got a little cushion here, so I'm just going to see what I can do. Mm -hmm. And it was basically, well, let me see what I can do. And uh, I did just fine. Mm -hmm. But I kept my overhead low. Uh -huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. I always have kept my overhead low, and I still do. With the station here, we keep the overhead low mm -hmm. because it gives you a freedom that uh, if you go in and overwhelm yourself with debt right, and uh, you need a lot of money to keep the doors open, mm -hmm. it's going to be much harder. Right. Yeah. Hard to sleep at night, too. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you. Yeah, hard to sleep at night, too. Yes. Yeah. So, um, 1989, you come up to Asheville. Well, so I had done very well in New Orleans, mm -hmm. and I uh, had a nice little uh, two-bedroom apartment or living room and a bedroom and, and a little work area, and um, that apartment was getting too small, and I felt like the next step up rent-wise was a mortgage payment. So mm -hmm. I decided I was going to buy a house. And, and no female in my family had ever considered mm -hmm. buying their own house yes. before. But yeah. I'm like, I, well. And, and unfortunately, was, we're in 2018, and there are still families where women, no female in that family have has owned owns a home. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So that now that was kind of a daunting idea, but I'm like, I'm going to go for it. Mm-hmm. And so I came up here, and I was I was living in New Orleans. And let me tell you, the New Orleans summers are so grim on you <laughs> that I was fantasizing about cool mountain nights. Ah. So that I would be guaranteed walking out of the house at 10 o'clock at night, and it was not going to be 120 degrees. <laughs> Yes, yes, so, with that humidity factor, yeah. So yeah. they had a big convention in New Orleans in August of 1988, and I decided I'm going to get out of town. I'm going to fly up there, and I'm going to see what the draw is because I was feeling a draw up mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. And so I was I think You I was said called. you had some – did you have some clients that were talking about or just people in well, general? Well, like I would be selling to clients or like I would sell to a, to a customer mm-hmm. – and then I would ask them where they were from and right. kind of chit-chat with them. And uh-huh. I always felt just green with envy whenever they were from uh, the mountains. Uh-huh. And I think it was that heat thing coming down on you all the time. <laughs> but I came here. I got off the – I got on I-26 in the rental car and saw these this stupefyingly beautiful mm. countryside. Mm-hmm. And I'm absolutely smitten. Right. And uh, so within four or five months, I had uh, left the business that I had in New Orleans, the retail part of mm-hmm. it, and um, had rented a truck and had my car attached to it, and mm-hmm. I drove it up here and moved into this house that I put a down payment on. So should we ascribe it as smartness on your part to come to Asheville already in a business where you, you brought your business with you? That will even, you brought your income even, earning even, even with back you. then. Even back then, this was in the late '80s. People would say, "Well, if you're going there, you're gonna have to take your own job with you." Mm-hmm. So that Do was. Do you think common. that that's still that that's still the case here in 2018? Well, I haven't I haven't looked for a job here, so I don't know. <laughs> right. But I knew back then, and I know that the general the general conversation uh, about the job situation here is that it's limited, and it's a and um, you really have to kind of you have to know somebody mm-hmm. or you have you have a service industry jobs mm-hmm. and hospital industry jobs and government industry jobs and there's uh the and those are all what some people call low low hanging fruit mm-hmm. kind of uh job opportunities mm-hmm. um so I think that it's probably still for the just ordinary person coming in, it's not that easy. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people with advanced degrees that are not mm-hmm. able to earn a living, earn well. Yeah. Yeah, well, that you could like you could in Atlanta. Right, right, with that same degree and knowledge mm-hmm. and everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Um, a few weeks ago, someone, um, it was on Facebook, it was a comment, and I had shared in, a, in an interview about going to California when I was 40 years old mm-hmm. and becoming certified as a yoga instructor and doing my Thai massage course and all of that. And the person um, complimented me about how great that was that I was in my 40s because she was now in her 40s and she was uh, pursuing a, a yoga certification. And I thought it was really interesting and never really contemplated it before because certainly in um, 2000, what is it, 2003, it never occurred to me that my age was an issue that it, that it, that that would be a reason why I couldn't start over again you know um, I thought maybe my abilities to be a good teacher you know to stand in front of people and instruct them on postures I thought about all the other things that would be difficult about that work but I never saw my age as being a factor and I think that you're the same way I mean because when you moved up here in, in 89, you were in your 40s by that time? No? Coming up I on it? I think I was, let's see, 42. In, in 82, I was 40. Okay. See, so. So I was 46 you, or 47. Uh huh. So did you even contemplate? Oh, 
Devine, you might be too old for this. You might need to, to stay. Me, to, yeah. It never occurred On to your me. That thing. <laughs> never. Yeah. It never occurred to me. Uh, but I have longevity genes, and I have really good health. Right. So I, uh, I didn't feel constricted in any way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and in and, and last year I, sh I switched my focus and at, at 54, and it, again, it didn't occur to me that I couldn't just start something new, you know? And I, I, I don't know anything about whether I have any longevity genes. I don't think so. My, my grandmother mother she passed away in her 70s in the late 70s so i don't think i'm yeah i'm supposed well, to yeah. well i'm i have done some genealogy research mm -hmm. on my past mm -hmm. my ancestors mm -hmm. and in the 1700s i had ancestors living into their 90s really and my grandmother when she died about 10 years ago she was about to be 101 and she had smoked and worked in the mill. Oh, really? And ate all that all that fried southern food, uh -huh. and and uh, didn't go to the doctor very much. Right. Yeah, because in the 1700s, you could die from a cold. <laughs> so, so, so I know from just from the history uh, that I studied in genealogy that uh, I've got another good 25 years. Mm. Mm-hmm. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you, um, have you had any business failures? I had business failure experience <laughs> from my second marriage. Uh -huh. And my husband at the time had commercial greenhouses. Uh -huh. And um, from him and his inability to be a good business person, I saw and learned what not to do. Mm. Really? And that tutorial was enough to guide you for, yeah? yeah be consistent. Yeah. Be <laughs> Show up on time. Show up on time. <laughs> don't be over, don't be going over there drunk out of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to sell a, boat, a truckload of plants to some nursery over in Alabama. <laughs> don't be doing that stuff. <laughs> it's it makes, not going to work. It makes for bad business practices. <laughs> Pay your water bill so they don't turn your water off. <laughs> what are your plans? <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> I don't know. That's if, what I learned. <laughs> I don't know if our listeners and those on Facebook are enjoying this conversation, but I certainly am. <laughs> that sounds like a high school course in how to run your own business, though. And you the know? funny thing was, he was a biology major, and he had been a high school teacher. Oh, really? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't a good high school learner, though, that's for sure. You know what the attraction was? That he looked just like Chris Christopherson. <laughs> <laughs> that's just... a reason to marry a man. <laughs> oh, well, I didn't say I was smart my whole life. <laughs> But from that experience, I did smarten up. <laughs> it's like, what were you thinking, girl? <laughs> yes. Sometimes you have to go left just to know what center is. Uh, yeah, you that, know? So I would say, yeah, that, the, what, what the learning experience was making a really bad second marriage. Uh, error. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. You know, and it puts you young, into the master's program of life. <laughs> when you're young, you make these kinds of bad decisions. Yeah, yeah. And then you spend the rest of your life figuring out what in the world <laughs> motivated me to do it that way. Yeah, but doing it that way is the reason why you're here right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, because I learned what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit, you know, harder on my head for some reason. I think I had to get into my 40s and start to get tired and go, you know, you know, we need to be doing something different. <laughs> well, you know, I, I had fallen back a little bit on my... Uh, literature and mm -hmm. Dante was like in you know halfway through life uh -huh. you, you go through you you, you you go you come to a reckoning uh -huh. and so at 35 so through the literature classes I'm like well I'm I'm at the halfway point <laughs> in my life and I need to start learning from these things instead of doing them. right yeah 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 wonderful so uh, you were you've had the station or you've had the license for the station, you acquired the license with your husband. What motivated the acquisition of this license? 
so there's a number of different elements uh, that attracted us to becoming involved in independent media, starting with the public access station that was Because you'd only been here. in retirement, what, two years? Well, yeah. You'd only been yeah. retired two years. Well, it was in 2012, yeah, so, but I was, uh, yeah, so, so I was making jewelry, but I was just kind of putzing around, uh -huh. you know. Um, but my husband and I became acutely aware of the need for more independent media, mm -hmm. uh, partly due to Katrina, partly due to our experience at the public access TV station that mm -hmm. was here for about three or four years, mm -hmm. and, as, and becoming more aware that media, all national, most five major corporations, uh, media is owned by and controlled by a, handful. a few mm -hmm. a few big conglomerates, commercial media. Mm -hmm. And independent media was created uh, in order to bring radio back to communities mm -hmm. and be able to have programs like this where you can sit for an hour and talk and not worry that you're having to pay the show host mm -hmm. uh, whatever amount a, right. uh, a commercial uh, yeah. station is and paid. And you got to get that advertising department going so yeah, you can and support it. And yeah. so, so it was created that uh, people uh, with a love for the community and wanting to participate in something significant for the community could come in and be a part of, uh, for example, our, be a part of our mission being to educate, inform, uh, and foster dialogue mm -hmm. about issues going on in the community. And my husband has a um, very um, philanthropic side. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 90s, for 10 years, he was the highest uh, donor to UNCA, the private donor, not mm -hmm. business donor. Mm -hmm. So he had this, this propensity about him. And so uh, when the station uh, was about to close because the previous owner couldn't pay the bills, mm -hmm. we met with them and said, well, what do we need to do? Mm -hmm. We met with their board. What do we need to do to be considered to receive the license and we'll take over the financial responsibilities and, and basically revive the station because mm -hmm. it had been off the air for about four or five years. Ah, okay. So it had been, uh, they, had, they had kept renewing a silent license. Mm -hmm. And uh, so through uh, their board voting to uh, transfer the license to us, uh, it, it happened that the FCC let the transfer go through in June of 2015. So the, this June 28th is the third year that we've held the license. Mm -hmm. My. And, and, and when we got the station, when we got the keys to the station, right. so to speak, um, we had no idea what we were getting into. <laughs> Is it like buying somebody's storage facility that don't let you see what's inside the storage facility? You just buy it and you take a chance? Basically, yeah, <laughs> that's a good analogy. Uh, because we really didn't know what we were getting into, and people who had been involved uh, were, there were some people who were not happy that our uh, nonprofit was the one chosen mm -hmm. to receive the license, and they had been running the station, and then because they weren't going to be able to be in control of it, they got, all got mad and left. So that really kind of left me mm -hmm. with the radio station falling in my lap. Right. So this is what I tell people. I'm the, well, the radio station just fell in my lap. <laughs> and, because, and then I had to figure out how to run it. Right. Because your involvement was just to acquire the license, and you just figured other people would be running yeah, with we, it. And you know, just kind yes, of oversee we it. We weren't we weren't foreseeing at the time. Whenever we met with them and their attorney and our attorney, and came up with a, an a, agreement mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we would be the ones that 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 needed to be there all the time, mm. running the station. Mm. We didn't, at the time we didn't realize that, but but things happened, and and we. Ended up having to. Do you uh, think you would have made a different different decision if you had known that you were going to end up having to do the day to day? You know, management that's a good of? question. We n it n it never occurred to us to not try to revive the station. Mm -hmm. And even if I'd have known all of the 
drama that was going to go on, I still would have done it. Uh, in since since uh, because it's a good choice for the community. It's it's a challenge. It's a wonderful challenge, uh, and I. It it was just too much of a cookie to not bite into. <laughs> <laughs> it was because how could you not want to do it? Right. Well, if you're, you're a technology person, you understand the need for the community for for more relevant programming. Mm -hmm. I uh, say to people when they're coming in to interview, I said, well, you know, we want you to be authentic on the radio. Authenticity mm -hmm. comes across. And and we, we really want uh, the station to be putting out either information or entertainment that's authentic mm -hmm. and relevant. Right. Um, so I'm just going to share a little bit about how I ended up with a radio show here. Okay. Because people ask me every now and then, oh, how'd you and get to a radio show, you know? And I said, well, actually, I was a guest on somebody else's radio show. And then <laughs> after I finished my interview, Davin came in and we sat there and we talked for long past the, the, the radio show being on. And at the end of the conversation, she said, you know, you should probably, you know, consider having a radio show. And, um, and I told him about how I just kind of looked at you and went, you know, I'm going to have to think about that. <laughs> I didn't come in wanting to have a radio show or even thinking in terms of having the talent for that, you know. But you saw something in that conversation that I certainly, I did not see at all. Well, you had a scintillating personality. <laughs> And you were down to earth, and you had had a lot of life experiences, and you had a lot of wisdom to share. Mm. Uh -huh. And I, we've had, um, we've had a problem getting women to come in mm -hmm. and do programming. Mm -hmm. And so, so if you're having issues of getting women to come in to do programming, that also means you got issues with women of color coming in to do programming as thank well. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've I have found myself having invited quite a few, and um, not as many invitations are accepted. And I, I, but I do understand it in a way. You know, I was a guest on um, another radio show here in Asheville, and. I'm authentic wherever it is that I go to, but put a microphone in front of me, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, people are listening. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, you caught me at a great time because I had been practicing doing Facebook Lives, and Facebook Lives were the thing that helped to bring my comfort level to another degree so that I could do this, you mm -hmm. know? So there are ways that you can practice that it, if it is a desire for you, if it is an interest for you to do a radio show or to even go on television, do some form of media, practice, get your phone, record yourself, you know, get through that sense of self-consciousness because there are ways of you diminishing that so that you can get a greater success, I think, you know? That, and you really have to have a story to tell, and you and whatever your topic and your subject matter is, it has to be a burning passion. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of my learning here at, at who who can do a show and do it well the people that really work out well are are people that are all in to their subject. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They eat and breathe and sleep it. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and people like and you that know, are like, and you've got to know that it's a real passion because we don't get paid. We're doing this because we really enjoy doing this. And you want to share it with the community. Yeah. Yeah, and you want to share it with the community, and you also want to be prepared, you know, mm -hmm. so you do your little bit of research of however much that you need, but, but yeah, you're vested into it, to show up on time, <laughs> to be here so that you're not all a nervous wreck three minutes before you go on air to be yourself settled, you know, you've got to be here and be prepared, plus show you, up, like you plus, said. Plus, 
you have to learn how to run all this stuff. Mm, yeah. That That's was a, a challenge. Yes. I mean, you mentioned just briefly your love of technology. And I'm like almost the complete opposite. Uh, technology is a necessary evil. When it works really well, I'm so thrilled. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'm so thrilled. But generally, when it doesn't work, I know what to do. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I saw you with uh, with a toolkit and, and, and stuff. You should see her. I mean, I, th I think, Davine, you could have made a great plumber or electrician or any of those kind of things, you know? Because in high school, they used to give us these aptitude tests, and I was supposed to be a mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So for you, this station wasn't daunting from the technological no. standpoint at all. It would be for me. And it, it's been a tremendous, it's been this beautiful evolution for myself with me and this board, you know, to know that I can actually do this. Oh, and Facebook Live all together. <laughs> I'm so proud of myself. You Ooh. should be. You should be because what you're doing, you're actually doing three jobs. You're interviewing. Mm -hmm. You're doing the, the interview. Right. You're working the equipment. Right. That's usually a producer's job. Plus, if you're doing Facebook Live, you're putting video out mm -hmm. in the public. So yeah. it's really, it's, and we, we ask a lot of our show hosts. Right. Uh, but you but, get mad skills. But you skills. can do it. But, you, but, it's, but we, you know, actually, no one else is concentrating on doing Facebook Live mm -hmm. on, from radio shows. No one else in town is doing it, mm -hmm. I don't think. Mm -hmm. And so it uh, elevates us a little uh, that we're doing that. Right. Uh, and, and shows that uh, bring uh, community affairs mm -hmm. and local artists that's our mission to do, mm -hmm. is to bring these things uh, out to more and more to people in the community. And uh, so it happens on the radio, but the fact that we can also take advantage of uh, making the reach go much further uh, using social media is pretty phenomenal to be able to do. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I'm happy that we're able to do it. Right. I mean, I do see that that my life has been bringing me here uh, to this point. You know, when I came up on the elevator the day that we were at arranged to meet to talk about it a little bit more, I remember coming up in the elevator and hearing this voice saying, you have a great voice for radio. And it's like it came out of the blue, and I know it was some past person. Um, I, I looked at this uh, computer astrological thing for myself, a generated um, a, a computer-generated astrological thing for me, for my sign, and radio was one of the things that they had as being potential professions, right? And at the time that I read it 10 years ago, I was like, Psh, you know, Psh, where am I? Radio, no, I don't think that's ever going to be happening, you know? And, and for me, the conversation is the most important thing. I just love the conversation that can open your eyes and where you can identify and also you know, you, you get this courage, you know, from somebody else's experience helps to give you some courage in your, in your own life and how you can show up more broadly, really explore your life and all the talents that you have. You know, that's what I love about conversations with you and, and your story that attracted me to wanting to, to, to talk to you is that you've just allowed your curiosity to just take you, you know, to, to just kind of follow it rather than allowing your fear to, to, to determine what you do. You know, uh, you touched on something, and my husband mentions this quite often, that he loves being around people who are intensely curious. Mm. And I have come to understand that that is a gift. Mm -hmm. It's not something that everyone has at right. all. Mm -hmm. uh, in my first marriage, we lived in Europe, and I was curious enough to travel all over Europe, all by myself, right. either on a on a wonderful train uh -huh. or driving uh, myself uh -huh. because uh, the Americans always were able to get an international driver's license mm -hmm. over there. And I was one of the few women who did that. Yeah, who would dare to go off who on would, your own. And it was because I was curious. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go see the ruins, uh, the, the uh, Roman ruins around Trier and, mm -hmm. and look at the dig. I wanted to see what it looked like. Right. And I wanted to go to Florence and go to the Uffizi Museum uh -huh. and, and the Italian Riviera. Mm, so yeah. I was just, I, and I'm, I understand it's a gift. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, 
And I think partly uh, the motive, part of the motivation for grabbing hold of the radio station is I feel that we all have gifts and that it's our responsibility to develop those gifts. And part of my gifts are being able to do technology and maybe a few other things that relate to the station. But um, I've seen people in my own family die without developing the mm. gifts. Yeah. And it's... Uh, and I don't, I don't want that for myself. Yeah. So I. Hey, it's too late for that to happen. <laughs> Absolutely too late. If you're just joining us, this is WPVM, a 103.7 low power community radio. And this is Yes, You Can. You can join us on our Facebook page um, if you'd like. It's WPVM. 103.7 Community Radio featuring the arts and culture of Asheville. You can catch us live on Facebook. Um, oh, let's do another message. Underwriter support for WPVM is made possible by Goodwill on what in Western North Carolina. Goodwill creates opportunities for people to enhance their lives through training, workforce development services, and collaboration with community organizations. More information on the web at Goodwill of North of Western North Carolina. Um, hmm, I'm trying to figure out. So, what's the future? What do you see? Because you're really quite innovative, you know, just the bringing in of Facebook, the, the, the improvements that you've made to, this, um, to the station in regards to the, the technology and bringing it up to, up to 2018 standards or getting close to. What's well, your future? I would, say, I would say that I don't quite know what mm -hmm. is going to happen I, because to me that's part of the magic of the creative experience mm -hmm. is – you, whenever I was making things and selling them, you use good ingredients, just like with food, you use good ingredients mm -hmm. and you put it all together and uh, you try to make a quality product and then, boom, the magic happens and people love the meal or they love the a product that you've made. And basically my philosophy is the same thing here is that I want to, we're working to put quality ingredients together. Mm -hmm whether it's the equipment or the people that are here doing their shows and then let's let the magic happen and see what see where we go there. Mm -hmm. Well, because so that's the spiritual side of it is l let the magic happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and trusting. Mm -hmm. And trusting. No, and well, well, I know from my past experience yeah. that if you have quality ingredients, uh -huh. it can't not turn out well. It's going to turn out well. Yeah. I don't know what it's going to be. <laughs> and I, trust me, back uh, 30 years ago, whenever I decided I'm going to be consistent, I'm going to be honest, mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen here, but here I'm running a radio station because of decisions that I made then. Mm -hmm. So I would never have ever imagined mm -hmm. that this would be something that came into my life. Yeah, well. And it's kind of magic. <laughs> Well, you're sitting across from somebody who's like feeling exactly the same way. I would have never have imagined that I would be sitting across from you having this conversation. Yeah, we on are. a radio show. But yeah, here it's we magical. are. It's magical. Yeah. Um, so I would say that the theme of your life has not just been following your curiosity, but also believing in yourself. Going to the theme of this radio show, which is Yes, You Can. I didn't start off uh, with that. I mm -hmm. started off with a very traditional... Um, uh, repressed southern female mm -hmm. that was supposed to do was supposed to get married and go have their kids and be safely ensconced and never ever come out of that little uh, cubby hole. Mm -hmm. That was a finishing school that you came from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a finish. <laughs> And that, that just didn't work out for me. Yeah. <laughs> so. You see, I was fortunate I didn't have to get married to understand that. <laughs> There's something in me that was so prevalent that went, no, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, what a wonderful conversation. 
Well, thank you very much. Do you know, I don't know if you know this, but you're, you've become a mentor. I mean, I, I never asked you that it was not been, for, uh, it's not been officialized in any kind of a way, but I love any woman that, whatever her age, whatever her age, that exhibits a quality that I myself would like to have included in my personality. I consider to be a mentor. You well, know? thank you very much. That's so sweet of you. No, well, but I mean... Because that's not something I would ever have assumed on my own, but to have you say that to me is very... I, I really, oh, I'm honored. Yeah, I, I, I think that there is so much that is lacking in, in the development and self-development for women if you don't have a mentor or if you've not attracted a few mentors mm -hmm. because... It, one isn't necessarily supposed to fit you. It's kind of like a husband. <laughs> it's not necessarily going to fit you all throughout your life, mm -hmm. but but to know that that it can only enhance your experience and help you in your learning. You know. Well, I uh, in in the past life in my commercial life or my profession. I was a milliner, mm. which is a fancy word for making fancy ladies' hats that you wore at weddings and derby uh -huh. and and royal weddings. Oh, uh, and there were. You think none. you could have a hat that could fit my head with all my hair? Well, <laughs> you would have to have a topper. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> If you see us on Facebook Live, then you will understand why I asked that question. Okay, right. sorry for the interruption. So. So, um, let me think. Let me you became a milliner. Yeah. And, um, well, I lost my train of thought there. But, um, the, at some point you made a, a switch. Because I remember oh, you telling I, me oh, that. Yeah. You, yeah. So, yeah. So, I was, um, so I did lessons. Mm -hmm. And I did lessons when I videotaped the lessons. I did them coming from the perspective of, when I started doing the fancy hats, uh -huh. I had no mentors to show me how. Right. Uh, and there wasn't any YouTube there, still? There wasn't any YouTube then. And the only place teaching it was the uh, Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. Uh -huh. And I really didn't want to go to New York for a couple of years. Right. So, so the mentoring, so what I did was when I got ready to videotape lessons, I, I, thought, well, I want to be the kind of person that I would have liked to have found mm. in the, in these lessons so that uh, I have kind of like a mentor showing me what to do here. Right. So, so the mentoring is a, uh, it, it probably is just as much of a uh, concept as our mission statement, which is to foster dialogue and, and meaningful dialogue mm -hmm. that, uh, Creates a better world. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember what it was a few years ago. I formed a group, and it was called Conversations That Matter, mm -hmm. and that is the, the exact the same sentiment mm -hmm. that um, it's conversations about things that will enhance, inspire, and ins expand, mm -hmm. illuminate, mm -hmm. open up your mind to just a little bit thinking of something from a different perspective, and how that can help to give you a much broader shift. You know. Well, in that. Uh, what you read in the beginning really ties right into that. Mm. I, what Maya Angelou had mm. to say, and that, that you ins want to inspire the getting out of survival mode and into really living and mm -hmm. learning. Yeah, about because there are higher and higher states of living. There mm -hmm. is, you know, there's exactly. just the basic. You know, what is it? Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah, his hierarchy. It it, um, it makes so much of a difference when you're able to get out of that survival mode and mm -hmm. really get in touch with how life can be so good, you know? Or challenging. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it can be good in the challenge as well, too. Intent, yes. You know? Yes. yes. Um, I thank you, listeners, for joining us. I've had a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Naveen, for um, uh, for being my guest today and, um, and sharing more about your vision about this station and your life. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I don't get to be on the radio very much. <laughs> Always behind the scenes. Oh. Have a great afternoon.
You're listening to WPVM LP, 103.7 Asheville.